Understanding Calvinism's Thinking, Behavior, and Language. Austin Ferrer, 1904, an Anglican theologian and philosopher in Faith and Speculation, warns that every time man attempts to frame God's providential activity into causal terms, placing God into a chain of sequential causalities, he risks degrading God to the creaturely level, ultimately creating a monstrosity and confusion. Preliminary note to the Calvinist reader. If you are a Calvinist reading this, you fall within two possible categories. 1. Questioning Calvinism. This is understandably the least likely possibility. And in this event, you are in the process of performing your own personal heartfelt inventory, interested in observations of the system from an outsider's point of view. I applaud you and pray that you continue running the race that is set before you, casting off every weight, being released from any bonds which hold you, ever increasing in making Jesus your first love. 2. The Staunch Calvinist this is understandably the most likely possibility, and in this event, you are likely in military reconnaissance mode. The follower of Christ does not directly intend to offend others. However, understanding human psychology, one knows that any critique of something which others are psychologically vested in will likely result in their experiencing insult or outrage. But since you are in reconnaissance mode, why not steel yourself as a good soldier and continue on, looking for ways to neutralize the information provided here? At minimum, the good you may derive from what is presented here is a perspective of the system's sociological characteristics from an outsider's point of view. As a dedicated Calvinist, you are probably keenly aware that in the realm of marketing, perception rules. So use the information provided here as a means of ascertaining the perception your potential customer base has on the product. And as much as possible, please bear in mind, the intent here is not to offend, but to inform. Introduction. Many trees of theology have evolved, with naturally occurring controversies ensuing between them. This is probably nowhere more prevalent than with the theology detailed by John Calvin, 1509, of France, a trained lawyer and later influential theologian during the second generation of the Protestant Reformation. Every tree brings forth fruit after its own kind, and the continuation of every species is dependent upon reproduction. One intent for this writing is to help, for a brief moment, lift the fog which obscures the least visible yet most critical components of Calvinism with the hopes that once one understands those components, the reason for Calvinist thinking, behavior, and language will become evident. The buyer of precious stones, who does not examine the gem under magnification, is soon parted from his money. This text attempts to help the reader obtain a magnified view of the tree and its branches, but more importantly, help the reader understand why Calvinists are forced to halt between two opinions and thus resort to the semantic and argumentation techniques which predominate their language. When the delineating line between good and evil is breached, and one morphs into the other, making the two almost indistinguishable within the nature and character of God, the expounder is forced to forward his assertions while reflecting benevolence, and confusion is guaranteed. Part 1. Calvinism's Socialization Processes, Milieu Control, a closed system of logic. The society of Calvinists dramatically differs from mainstream Protestant Christianity and Catholicism in the emphasis it puts on adherence to doctrine. The doctrine becomes a cherished identity marker and a trophy which separates the Calvinist from all other Christian groups. The doctrine sets them apart as superior. The doctrine is therefore sacred. Calvinist pastors can be observed brooding over their congregation's assimilation of the doctrine. It is quite common for Calvinist leaders to counsel congregations against exposing themselves to alternative forms of biblical scholarship, no matter how highly that scholarship is recognized internationally. The Calvinist authority structure seeks to exert a much higher degree of control over information. Thus, Calvinism sociologically has for many years been a closed system with its own unique values and its own unique language.
applying what social psychologists call milieu control. The control processes at work within the Calvinist authoritarian social structure controls feedback from group members and refuses to be modified, which results in a closed system of logic. It is consistently observed that Calvinists manifest a pronounced degree of partisanship, an almost obsessive allegiance to the doctrine and to idolized persons, prompting the concern that the respecting of persons within the system is so pervasive that it may represent a form of seductive entrenchment to which Christian youth are significantly vulnerable. Over time, the mental conditioning that results goes far beyond simple belief in, or love for Christ, as Christ is not the central focus of the doctrine. As the individual interacts with others whose minds have become similarly reformed, the mental conditioning dramatically reinforces itself and becomes a unique reality which frames all comprehension of things pertaining to God and Church. When the non-Calvinist speaks about God or biblical things, the Calvinist may quite literally hear confusion or heresies because his mind is so locked into the milieu and it frames his cognitive perceptions so pervasively. He eventually cannot comprehend any thinking that doesn't affirm it. Free thinking and personal beliefs are monitored and permitted as long as they do not contradict central dogma. God-ungodliness oxymorons are so subliminally assimilated in his concepts of God that when he speaks, he speaks English, and one thinks they know what he is saying, without recognizing when they don't, or understanding how pervasively his frame of reference stems from a good evil dualistic worldview which the system conditions him to obfuscate, and which eventually becomes his normalcy through the process of internalized acceptance. These socialization processes are the first step in our ability to understand Calvinistic thinking, behavior, and language. Part 2. What is Truth? Notes from Dr. William D. Lutz on Doublespeak. What is reality? Reality is not external. Reality exists not in the mind of the individual, who soon perishes. Reality exists and flourishes from one generation to the next, in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. What the party defines as reality, that is real. And how else can the party do that? But by language. The party takes control of language and takes it away from the individual. And that is where the party gets its power. Because those in power who control language control the lens through which people see their world. Power and doublespeak can be statistically measured and traced in persons within organizations, and the two frequently manifest in proportional measure. Doublespeak is one of the most ancient weapons in social domination games. When the group realizes the manipulative strength of doublespeak, it eventually becomes that group's normalcy. They all speak it to one another quite unconsciously and without even thinking about it. Anyone who achieves power, knowingly or instinctively, learns how to use the party's doublespeak with increasing sophistication. Doublespeak euphemisms, phrases, mantras, and two-faced words become recognized within the group for the powerful tool that they are, for the promotion and defense of the system, and soon everyone in the group who yearns for preeminence becomes its apprentice. And there will always be one who will rise above the rest, prove himself a champion, and become a master in its use, fathering a new generation of doublespeak. Jesus called his disciples and said, You see how the Gentiles katakirio usin one another, it shall not be so among you. Mark 10.42 Peter warns the shepherds of the flock not to katakirio ontes those in their charge. 1 Peter 4.3 a man controlled by a demon spirit leapt upon them and Katakiryu sass them. Acts 19.16 Gaming language is a most potent weapon used by marketers, cunning politicians, lawyers, magicians, and sophisticated groups. Doublespeak, then, is a weapon for Katakiryu Usin. Why did Pilate disparagingly ask Jesus, What is truth? Because his was a world of political intrigue in which men katakiryu uzin one another, using both the weaponry of steel and the weaponry of language.
Part 3. Semantic Representations and Power. Notes from Steven Pinker. The Stuff of Thought. Within intense and eventful disputes between men, debates are hardly ever about the facts. Most people agree on the facts. Where they differ is in the construal of those facts. How they intricate a swirl of matter and space out to be conceptualized by human minds. And the categories in this dispute permeate the meanings of words in our language because they permeate the way we represent reality in our heads. Semantics is about the relation of words to thoughts, but it is also about the relation of words to reality. It is the way which parties commit themselves to a shared understanding of truth and the way their thoughts are anchored to things and situations in the world. It is about the relation of words to a community. Many disputes entail two ways of framing a debate, which are pitted against each other, and the disputants struggle to show that their framing is more apt. Does stem cell research destroy a ball of cells or a living human being? Does abortion consist of ending a pregnancy or of killing a living baby? Does the mainstream Christian find Calvinism distasteful because he is a carnal-minded, semi-Pelagian heretic who chafes at the bit of God's rule, or because glorified evil and Calvinist tactics are outside his ethical boundaries? Are Calvinist assertions motivated by a divinely inspired and righteous desire to glorify God, or a diotrephes urgency for preeminence and the need to kata curiosus all who are deemed competitors, competing disputes, can be likened to the game, King of the Hill, where power is exercised in the form of semantic representations. The party who can ultimately define and label itself as holy and the other as evil wins the game and dominates the hill. In this game, words become weapons of destruction. History is rewritten by the victor, and truth is redefined by the conqueror. Part 4. Recognizing the Structure of a House the roof of a house does not stand upon a platform of thin air. Underlying structure must support it. Siding, shutters, doors, windows, and ornate facing all require underlying support. It is critical to be able to differentiate those components, which are ornamental, from those which are structural. And every house must have a foundation. Many who have sought to examine the house of Calvinism have done so by concentrating on its ornamental components without recognizing the foundation upon which those components rest. Many have sought to focus their examination on its acronym TULIP. Such an examination will often produce negative returns, simply because the components under examination are in fact merely ornamental, while the underlying foundational structure upon which the surface components exist is left undisclosed. Part 5. The Underlying Substratum The Foundational Proposition Calvinism is dedicated to the proposition that God conceives, determinatively causes, and meticulously renders certain all events which occur in time. For Calvin, this proposition functions as the underlying substratum and foundation of understanding of every aspect of God's relationship to creation, and Calvin accepts it without question. This proposition is the foundation, cornerstone, and template upon which every additional aspect of the house is built. Since it functions as the underlying foundation for the system, it is also the least visible component. And since it is a philosophical construct, it is the one the Calvinist is least likely to reveal. Calvin reasons that if a person P has a thought T at moment M, which then becomes event E, then E obtained inevitable and unavoidable, because God conceived, determinatively caused, and then meticulously rendered certain E would obtain in such a way as to make E compulsory. And conversely, that God allows no alternative of E to ever obtain. For Calvin, God has created a world in which only what God determinatively causes and meticulously controls and renders certain will ever obtain. The causal mechanism through which God accomplishes this, Calvin asserts, as divine immutable decrees. Calvin reasons that in such a world if person P becomes saved, at moment M, and this then becomes a salvific event S for P, 
then God wanted S for P to obtain in such a way that is causally compulsatory. And conversely, if God does not want S for P to obtain, then S for P is not possible. In this causally determined world, God gives absolutely no alternative possibilities to the creature. Only what God conceives, determinatively causes, and meticulously renders certain is possible. On this view, the reason any person is saved or not has nothing causally to do with the person, nor does it have anything to do with the condition of the person. The reason a person is saved or not is because God designs each person for his or her perspective purpose. Here, Calvinists may appeal to Paul's potter and clay analogy, where they resolve a saved person, one who is designed by God as a vessel of honor versus a damned person, one who is designed by God as a vessel of wrath. Calvin further asserts that God establishes totalitistic causation for every event, for each individual, millennia before the individual exists in time. In Calvin's words, God determines each man's lot in life and does so at the foundation of the world. Calvin further asserts that God establishes totalitistic causation for every event, for each individual, millennia before the individual exists in time. In Calvin's words, God determines each man's lot in life and does so at the foundation of the world. Calvinist theologian R.C. Sproul enunciates the underlying proposition by asserting, if there is one single molecule in this universe running around loose, God is not God. And Calvinist Paul Helm asserts, not only is every atom and molecule, every thought and desire, kept in being by God, but every twist and turn of each of these is under the direct control of God. Calvin enunciates every faculty of man as causally determined by stating, Man, by the righteous impulsion of God, does that which is unlawful. Institutes 1.16 William Lane Craig, an American Christian apologist, philosopher, and theologian, identifies the underlying proposition upon which Calvinism is founded as universal divine causal determinism. God solely causally initiates and meticulously controls every event that obtains, universally, exclusively, immutably, and without any limitation. Calvinist, Dr. James N. Anderson of the Reformed Theological Seminary, Charlotte, N.C., in his published work, Calvinism and the First Sin, states the underlying proposition, it should be conceded at the outset and without embarrassment that Calvinism is indeed committed to divine determinism. The view that everything is ultimately determined by God, take it for granted as something on which the vast majority of Calvinists uphold and may be expressed as the following. For every event E, God decided that E should happen, and that decision alone was the ultimate sufficient cause of E. Dr. Anderson also states that Calvinism is committed to a compatibilist form of free will. Since the underlying proposition is automatically presupposed, it becomes, and most often subconsciously, the single concept which controls every aspect of the Calvinist's perception of God. And because it is presuppositional, it consistently works as an invisible barrier to coherent dialogue with non-Calvinists. And a multitude of fruitless disputes perennially occur over controversies, simply because the non-Calvinist doesn't recognize the underlying presupposition, and Calvinists are consistently unlikely to enunciate it. Such dialogue is as successful as two ships attempting to exchange cargo while passing each other in the night. In other words, the two parties spend countless hours speaking past one another. The non-Calvinist walks away perplexed, and the Calvinist walks away feeling misunderstood, and rightly so. Calvin eventually addresses the question of whether God can allow or permit events in time to occur. And here, Calvin forcibly rejects all such considerations, calling them repulsive, in Calvin's vernacular, odious, concerning the eternal predestination of God, page 176. For Calvin, the idea that God merely allows an event to obtain would seriously compromise God's divine right to directly cause and meticulously control all events through compulsory causation. Such an idea for Calvin is simply unthinkable, 
and he would waste no time and direct no small number of harsh pejoratives at anyone who would to any degree compromise God's sovereignty. With Calvin, often using appeal to divine rigor in regard to God, or argumentum ad hominem in regard to detractors, there is no tolerance for any compromise to God's absolute monarchical control over all events. Calvin's doctrine can be seen as a form of governance known as monarchical absolutism, or simply absolutism, which Calvin has superimposed on God and his cosmos. In monarchical absolutism, a critical attribute of the monarch is sovereignty, and the doctrine asserts that the monarch cannot be held accountable to any humanly known standard of ethics. In most cases, the divine right of unaccountability is said to be endowed upon the monarch by a god. In the Egyptian dynasty, the monarch was Pharaoh and the god Horus. Shulgi of Sumeria, 21st century BC, declared himself divine. In Rome, Caesar was declared Pontifex Maximus, bridge builder between heaven and earth, which would be later ascribed to the Roman Pope. This man-god ruler model was the predominant form of governance worldwide throughout the human timeline until about the 19th century. During Calvin's day, monarchical absolutism appeared in the form of the, the divine right of kings, where it was asserted as a doctrine of grace and defended by Protestants of the Reformation mostly for political reasons. It is possible Calvin simply saw absolutism as the divine model. In obsessively adhering to his underlying proposition, Calvin paints himself into a corner, where he is eventually forced to depict through its lens God's role in evil events. In his voluminous writings, Calvin will make depictions of God's conduct, which will implicitly infer a God who is predisposed towards evil as either heartless aggression in order to display voluntaristic utilitarian prowess or of deriving pleasures from torture. Such conduct from God is defended as his divine right, often with appeals to the words of Paul. Who are you, O man, to reply against God? Calvin's representations of God in this fashion have caused no small measure of discomfort among Scripture readers who see Scripture consistently representing God's predisposition towards evil as one of reluctance, based upon an overarching predisposition towards benevolence. But for Calvin, benevolence is irrelevant under the shadow of God's sovereignty, as are ethics, because sovereignty is the supreme attribute and divine right of the king, i.e., God. Calvin acquires his unflinching hold on this underlying proposition by his ardent admiration for Augustine, 354 through 430 AD, an early Roman Catholic theologian, philosopher, and bishop of Hippo in Algeria. Calvinists historically applaud Augustine as the philosophical and theological father of the system. Part 6. The Human Psyche and the Color of Syncretism If you've ever been in a store where people buy paint, you've probably seen the mixing of primary colors, very precisely measured into a base color. This mixing process results in a well-controlled final color. We humans find it easy to mix paints together. If, for example, we mixed white with blue, our final color would result in a light blue. Easy, right? But once those two colors are mixed together, it is not easy for us to examine the resulting color and discern the original blue from the original white. It's virtually impossible. Nor is it possible for us to separate the white and the blue back into their original forms. Now let's say someone mixed various paints into one and sold it to you claiming it was the original. Firstly, you would find it highly difficult to discern what the original colors were. And secondly, if you placed a high degree of trust in that person, you would be inclined to believe what you were told, which is a reflection of your psyche. Perhaps this is what the scripture means when it says, The word of God is quicker than a two-edged sword, dividing soul from spirit. Syncretism works the same way. When components from various religions are synchronized together, we no longer have the original, but instead we have a final result, based on a mixture, which we embrace as the original. We may be psychologically invested in the assertion that our resulting religion is the superior and pure one, and we may blindly and forcefully assert it 
as the original, just because we have an emotional need to perceive it as such. Thus, the color of syncretism often reflects the color of the human psyche. Without the Holy Spirit, we don't have the ability to discern what is of the soul and what is of the spirit within ourselves, nor do we have the ability to divide them. And we can't even start such an investigation if we've been taught to deny it can't possibly happen to us, or to deny a mixture exists, or simply if our psyche depends upon it not existing. That is the color of syncretism. And we currently see numerous theologies which are thoroughly syncretistic, with each heavily vested in, claiming theirs as the original. One observation we sadly recognize among their tactics is to take their unique distinctive syncretistic form of Christianity and superimpose it on all things honored in the early church, surreptitiously deceiving people into believing the syncretistic system is the original. Part 7. The Human Condition, Money Changers and Dependency What does a drug dealer do when he wants to establish a new client? He gives out free samples of the drug. He presents himself as benevolent, coming to the client's aid in time of need. But the underlying methodology is to establish within the client a relationship of dependency. Slowly yet gradually, delight inches its way towards addiction within the unsuspecting. As the dependency becomes entrenched, the dealer starts to require various forms of reimbursement. After all, money doesn't grow on trees. Cable networks may first establish themselves as commercial-free. However, once the necessary clientele have become sufficiently invested, in come the commercials, which was the plan from the beginning. Campaigning politicians are prone to make promises, which government money changers quietly know cannot possibly be kept. But such promises work wonderfully at drawing in individuals who are inclined to trust. We are, in fact, surrounded by goods and services which we are quite dependent upon. We go about busy lives from one dependency to another without allowing ourselves to consider the consequences of our dependencies. Dependencies are a reality of our nature, our physical and psychological makeup. The ancient art of priestcraft operates on and monopolizes the understanding of how easy it is to draw people into psychological dependencies using religion. The priests of Egypt were experts at using religious concepts as a platform from which to exploit the masses. Exploitation produces wealth, privilege, and power. Every society has its priests and money changers which operate in both secular and religious garb, and the masses will always be taught to see these persons in a benevolent light. Right now, a ministry is selling tiny plastic packets of tap water advertised as holy water, which can cure any financial or physical ailment. These ministries flourish and become the rich man, which Jesus compared to a camel going through the eye of a needle. And why is it, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, because our societies indoctrinate us into perceiving such men in the best light. The very men who are experts, either wittingly or unwittingly, at drawing us into relationships of dependency, we are taught to trust. And once the dependency is established, we are not inclined to escape its ensnarement, because we have a vested interest in making believe ensnarement couldn't possibly happen to us or doesn't exist. Part 8. Calvin's Undying Adoration for All Things Augustine one of the decisive developments in the Western philosophical tradition was the eventual widespread merging of the Greek philosophical tradition with the Judeo-Christian religious and scriptural traditions. In the embryonic development of Roman Catholicism, Augustine is one of the main figures through and by whom this merging was accomplished. Of the Greek philosophical traditions, none influenced Augustine's theology more than Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism became widely influential at around the 3rd century AD and persisted until shortly after the closing of Plato's Academy in Athens at around 520 AD. After Plato's death, approximately 347 BC, 
Various Greek schools of thought vied to claim the name of Plato for their tradition, with each claiming theirs as the premier representative of Plato's thought. One such school, which rose to predominance, was that of Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism was essentially the works of Plato framed into religious form. The Roman Catholic Church recognized Plato's prowess within the pagan Neoplatonists' religio-philosophy, and Catholicism assimilated Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism represented a great horn of power, and any religion that could claim it as a possession hoped to obtain a place of domination with it. For nine years prior to Neoplatonism, Augustine was a disciple of a semi-Christian Gnostic dualistic sect known as Manichaeism. Christian Gnosticism asserted a significant presence in its day, and the Gnostic sect of Manichaeism flourished in the ancient world. Manichaeism spread with extraordinary speed through both the East and West, from North Africa to China. Being widely promoted by apostles, it reached Egypt at around 240 AD and Rome at around 280 AD. The Roman Emperor Galerius issued the Edict of Toleration in 311 AD, which ended the Diocletianic persecution of Christianity. Manichaean monasteries existed in Rome in 312 AD, during the time of the Catholic Pope, Miltiades. In 312 AD, Constantine defeated the Roman Emperor Maxentius and marched into Rome, bearing his rival's severed head as a trophy and assumed control. After the usual celebrations and gladiator spectacles, he built the Arch of Constantine, displaying himself in the lineage of Roman conquerors, depicting the sun, god Apollo, along with other Roman gods. Constantine would later present the Pope Miltiades with the Laterne Palace, which would become the papal residence and the seat of Catholic governance. From then on, the Roman Church grew in political power and soon carried forward the Roman tradition of domination, occasionally rioting and killing those who posed opposition. Traces of the assimilation of paganism are visible everywhere at Catholic sites. Catholics adoringly touch statues of Pan, Jupiter, and the goddess Isis and Child, being told they are David, Peter, and Mary with Jesus. It is an undisputed fact that the lineage of Catholic doctrines evolved in a significantly syncretistic manner. This is a period of time during which the Roman Church was becoming a dominating world power, and in its growth, it consumes and adds to itself the distinctions of every form of paganism. The syncretistic processes of evolution at this time cannot be understated, and the realization of the tree becoming hybrid is inevitable. Rather than wrestle against principalities and powers, the tradition was to co-opt them. History will then evidence the burning to the stake of young mothers for teaching their children the Lord's Prayer, or families for reading scripture and the massacre of whole villages. English historian Theodore Maynard, in the story of American Catholicism, writes, It has often be charged that Catholicism has been overlaid with many pagan incrustations. Catholicism is ready to accept that charge and to make it her boast. The great god Pan is not really dead, he is baptized. In the Neoplatonist worldview, all things have an infinite, timeless, and unchangeable god as the cause of their existence. Some of the dualistic elements within Manichaeism were also shared, as Neoplatonism was heavily influential among the Gnostics. For Neoplatonists, it would be possible to categorize both good and evil as good or less good, and possibly not evil at all, since all things emanate from the One, and the One is beautiful and good. Therefore, all things exist in the One, in the form of undifferentiated unity, as elements divinely synchronized within the One, of necessity containing good and evil, along with all other constituents of the cosmos. Sin and evil can then be stated as beautiful and good, since they are necessary parts of the wholeness of the One. These constructs would be imbibed by the Catholic Neoplatonists, and Augustine would carry them forward, and in his eloquent writing, baptize them as Christian, just like the great god Pan. Augustine asserts the good-evil dualism, where he writes, 
And because this orderly arrangement maintains the harmony of the universe by this very contrast, it comes about that evil things must need be. In this way, the beauty of all things is in a manner configured, as it were, from antitheses, that is, from opposites. This is pleasing to us even in discourse. Ord 1.7, 19. The subtle nuance in Augustine's synthesis is that it has God requiring evil in order to be whole, or at least for his goodness to be fully actualized and manifested. This concept reappears within modern Calvinist enunciations where it is asserted that God needs to send people to eternal torment, i.e., manifest evil, in order to manifest good. Without the flowery, eloquent language, this is simply called yin-yang. The worldview of Gnostic good-evil dualism will then frame Calvinist enunciations of God and cosmos, which manifest in the form of subtle God-ungodliness oxymorons, which the non-Calvinist cannot possibly recognize because he doesn't understand the underlying worldview which frames them. One of Neoplatonism's most prominent pagan teachers, Plotinus taught that a person must turn inward to find God, who is identical with the inner reality of the soul. Plotinus was considered a monist, intellectual mystic, and a genius in argumentation. Author Stephen McKenna in The Influence of Plotinus, traced in St. Augustine, observes within Augustine's Confessions evidences of at least two mystical meditation experiences which clearly follow the Neoplatonic model. Mystic meditation was a practice emphasized by the Neoplatonists to aid the believer in becoming assimilated into the One. Plotinus himself, however, rebuked Gnosticism's good-evil dualism, writing against it in his ninth tractate of the Second Enneads, which he titled, Against Those That Affirm the Creator of the Cosmos and the Cosmos Itself to be Evil. Neoplatonists held that everything existed only to the extent to which it participated in the One. For the Christian Neoplatonist, spiritual growth was not marked by the manifestation of good works, but by passively experiencing the One. Augustine would carry this forward by formulating that union with God in knowledge and love supplants obedience to the Lord, along with any possible reward for faithful service. J. Patu Burns, in Theological Anthropology, states, As liberty matures, implying Neoplatonist maturity, the person ceases to deliberate and decide, implying the loss of independent volition. He gives himself ever more fully and spontaneously to the increasingly manifest and attractiveness of God. This enunciation of spiritual growth bears an uncanny resemblance to what is known as gradual entrenchment by a counterfeit force, cited in cases of possession, in which the individual gradually relinquishes volition or faculties to a counterfeit spirit. Other elements found in Gnosticism, which will reappear, are the doctrine of individual election and the doctrine of the divine spark, which was the Gnostics' way of enunciating that man was totally unable to respond to God's salvific outreach and thus requires a divine spark in order to be vivified to salvation. This then parallels the Calvinist assertion that salvation precedes faith. The Gnostics may enunciate that men are born into different fields. Some are born into the field of salvation, while others into a field of corruption, and therefore utterly lost from birth. We see this concept paralleled within the Calvinist terminology of two domains of providence and total depravity. Augustine corresponded by letter to a close friend, Nebridius, who praises how Augustine's letters speak of Christ, Plato, and Plotinus. The recognition of intense syncretism here is unavoidable. Catholic Platonists used Platonic concepts as a lens through which they believed they could more clearly see and understand the nature and character of God. Even today, one will find advertisements for Christian academic materials, positing this sentiment. The doctrines of Plotinus are advertised as providing a superior understanding of Scripture. Sparks notes. 
Augustine's lasting influence lies largely in his success in combining the Neoplatonic worldview with the Christian one. In Augustine's hybrid system, the idea that all creation is good in as much as it exists means that all creation, no matter how nasty or ugly, has its existence only in God. Because of this, all creation seeks to return to God, who is the purest and most perfected form of the compromised being enjoyed by individual things. Again, then, any story of an individual's return to God is also a statement about the relationship between God and the created universe. Namely, everything tends back toward God, its constant source and ideal form. Part 9 Dualistic Cosmology's Affect on Exegesis versus the People of the Book Greek cosmology represents man's focus on three primary concerns, origins, evolution, and fate, while Greek teleology represents man's focus on purpose. As a result, laws of causation were of interest to Greek intellectuals. In Hellenized world, those who lacked analytical knowledge of these things were construed as walking in a form of ignorance. An intellectual such as Augustine would certainly not want to perceive himself as member of the blind and ignorant masses. Greek intellectualism applied considerable force into the intellectual world of Augustine's day. This readily explains Augustine's intellectual venture through the highly popular semi-Christian Gnostic system of Manichaeanism and the highly popular pagan system of Neoplatonism. In contrast to this, the preponderance of Jewish worldview was based upon Hebrew scriptures, which had been meticulously copied throughout Jewish history. Many Greeks looked disparagingly upon Hebraic concepts as a reflection of primitive, ignorant thinking. The Jewish people had been long classified as the people of the book. The pattern we see in Scripture reflects its author's focus. For them, a concern with a Platonic analysis of the cosmos would be as valuable as arguing over how many angels fit on the head of a pin. For the people of the book, such thinking is simply blind speculation and egotistical intellectualism. There were a few Jewish intellectuals who found Platonic concerns tantalizing, but not so as to dramatically affect the Jewish traditional understanding of God and his relationship to man, and not so as to dramatically affect the Jewish exegesis of Scripture. But this is not the case for Augustine. A cursory review of Manichaeism's doctrinal worldview reveals a system that is deeply affected by Greek, Parthian, Middle Classic Persian, Coptic, Chinese, and Zoroastrian concepts. Twins are a consistent conception within many pagan religions and cultures around the world. In some, they are seen as ominous, and in others, as auspicious. Twins in mythology are often cast as two halves of the same whole, sharing a bond deeper than that of ordinary siblings, or otherwise shown as fierce rivals. The concept of twins also appears within some religions as a dualistic cosmos. The gods Apollo and Artemis are twins. The god Pan appeared in either a benevolent or malevolent form. In Hinduism, the Ashwini twins, or Ashvins, are the healers who are also offered sacrificial offerings, or oblations, as per the Rig Veda. In Shingu mythology of Brazil, the twin brothers Kuat and Ayae forced the evil king Urubutsun to give light to the world, and Kuat became the sun with Ayae as the moon. The Egyptian creation story included the earth god Geb and the sky goddess Nut, who were twins. As we start to approach the cultures and times that would have more influenced Augustine, we have Basilides, 117 AD, who taught a form of Gnosticism which incorporated the dualistic deity, Abraxas, and he claimed to have inherited his teachings from Matthew. But the dualistic system that would have been of greatest influence would be the Zoroastrian system, incorporated into Manichaeism, having twin gods Ahriman and Ahura Mazda, who represent divine evil and divine good. Manichaeism therefore taught that the cosmos contains an opposition of two principles, good and evil, each equal in relative power and necessity. 
And thus we have a dualistic cosmos in which good and evil share equal divine status. When a dualistic cosmology and a Neoplatonic view of God are synchronized with the monotheistic God of Christianity, what will appear is an immutable God whose relationship to good and evil are utilitarian. Scriptures which speak of God repenting of making man or giving man the choice between life and death become a curiosity because the Neoplatonic God is immutable, i.e., unchangeable, and therefore cannot change his mind or give choices to his creatures. Such scriptures must be allegorized or interpreted with complex, non-explicit distinctions in order to be rightly understood. Scriptures in the New Testament that speak of predestination can readily be interpreted in the framework of the Gnostic good-evil dualism, where those individuals who are predestined to the light are awakened by the divine spark, while others are destined to the dark. Both acts of predestination are equally holy because both manifest the glory of the One. The believer would learn how to compartmentalize a good-evil dualism, stoicism, and to love and desire a utilitarian God. The Manichaeans are definitely not people of the book. As such, their focus reached out much farther than the simple worldview found within the authors of Scripture. Gnostic urgencies, therefore, do not fit the biblical pattern of being simply focused on man's right relationship to his Creator. Manichaeistic thinking was a labyrinth of complex, multi-layered, and highly detailed explanations concerning the origins and evolution of divine beings and man. Augustine will become its intellectual disciple for nine years of his life and fully embrace many of its concepts. For him to transition out of its complex labyrinth on his intellectual journey towards Catholicism is going to take years of intellectual, analytical contemplation. Augustine is not one to simply throw away concepts that he has previously embraced as infallible truth. He is persuadable, but as he grows older and his power and influence increase within the Catholic monarchical system, his evolving theology becomes reliant upon his own internal critical faculties. Manichaeistic and Neoplatonic concepts deemed honorable must be tweaked in order to fit and emerge as a Catholic neo-Orthodox theology. Because of these influences, Augustine's thinking does not fit the biblical pattern of being focused simply on man's relationship to God. Augustine's need to avoid being a member of the blind and intellectually ignorant masses, so looked down upon by Greek intellectualism, forces him to go beyond the biblical focus and therefore beyond the biblical pattern. Additionally, the post-apostolic fathers never had such intense platonic influences borne upon them and Augustine thus cannot rely upon them as legitimate sources compared to the sophisticated Platonic thinking of his day. Therefore, the urgencies which drive Manichaeistic thought and the urgencies which drive Neoplatonic thought become urgencies which influence Augustine's exegesis. Thus, Augustine's insatiable intellectual quest impels him to journey to places where no high-standing Christian theologian has ever gone before. It's ironic how syncretism contributes to raising Augustine, to be lauded as one of the great ones in his theological tradition. It has often been said that arrogance is the dark side of knowledge. One of the fruits of the Augustinian tradition will be its reputation for exhibiting a self-applauding air of superiority within the Calvinist fold. The Augustinian tradition therefore inherently lends itself to things Jesus pointed out as disdainful such as straining at exegetical gnats while swallowing the camels of Manichaeism and Neoplatonism, an insistence upon the best seat in the synagogue of Christian theologies, to be lauded as great ones in the Christian marketplace, a proud repetitive exhibition of wide stoic phylacteries, a love for being honored by men and making sure the outside of the cup appears clean when the inside is full of linguistic magicianry, at around 418 A.D., Augustine produced two treaties on the grace of Christ and on original sin. Many did not hesitate to agree with Augustine's assertion that the salvation process is totally dependent upon unmerited favor. 
But they were in no way comfortable with Augustine's insistence that God did not allow an individual the freedom to dissent, citing it as a form of inescapable ensnarement. It does bear an uncanny resemblance to a mystical potion or spell, a type of seduction or divine magic. It could be seen as a mode of human inducement common within the occult, and therefore antithetical and abhorrent to a Holy Spirit. They additionally disagreed with Augustine's assertion that no amount of sinning could affect one's salvation. Augustine responded to these objections, and disputes over these issues would continue perennially, now known as Augustine's controversial doctrines of predestination, which Calvin would later adoringly carry forward. The scripture says that all see through a glass darkly. The question then remains, which glass? For Augustine, that lens was a combination of Gnosticism, Christ, Plato, and Plotinus. For Calvin, Augustine became the only right lens through which one views Scripture, and the tree continues to bring forth fruit after its kind. Part 10. Questions. The why and how concerning events which come to pass. With universal divine causal determinism functioning as the center of his universe, Calvin's answers are fairly consistent. For the question of why events come to pass, the answer is most often, for God's good pleasure. For the question of how events come to pass, the answer is most often, all events are ordained at the foundation of the world by immutable decrees. Where this becomes most problematic is when these answers are automatically applied to the why and how of evil events which come to pass. Calvin writes, Nor ought it to seem absurd when I say, that God not only foresaw the fall of the first man, and in him the ruin of his posterity, but also at his own pleasure arranged it. Institutes 3.23.7 There are hideously evil events which come to pass. For example, a young child is raped, her body cut into pieces and buried, or an event where employees of a chicken nugget processing factory were murdered, and their bodies discovered in the breaded nugget product, distributed to various restaurants. Such events are terribly hideous, and yet they fall into Calvin's universal category of all things that come to pass. And thus, Calvinism's answer to the why and how applies universally. So, of course, this begs the question, does the Calvinist construe that God ordains such events for his good pleasure? If one is to remain rationally consistent to Calvin's universal assertions, it most certainly must be a foregone conclusion. Else man threatens to compromise God's good pleasure or his sovereignty. We should then readily understand why and how Calvinists navigate around these topics and fiercely reject any rational conclusions that threaten the radiant luster of the sacred object to which they are significantly invested. If the Calvinist speaks clearly and unambiguously, he must assert that evil events occur in order to service God's good pleasure and manifest his sovereignty. However, such a concept would surely fit the model of sadism, which is defined as a deliberate cruelty, and the tendency to derive pleasure from inflicting pain, suffering, or torment upon others. This puts the Calvinist in an obviously troublesome position, as he is required to assert Calvin's basic propositions for the why and how of all events. All the rational individual need do is follow Calvin's answer to its logical conclusion in order to recognize God's conduct is viewed as fitting the model of sadism. And so we can see how taking his reasoning to its logical conclusion backfires on the Calvinists, claim that the system he cherishes is superior in the light of divine holiness. Voltaire, 1694, French Enlightenment writer, historian, and philosopher, in the age of Louis XIV, writes, It is dangerous to be right in matters on which the established authorities are wrong. And Jesus went into a synagogue on the Sabbath day, where there was a man with a withered hand. And the Pharisees, whose doctrine was Bible-based, challenged Jesus, asking him if it were God's will to heal on the Sabbath day. Matthew 12, 1-2. 
But the man's parents spoke these words to the Pharisees out of fear, because they knew anyone who confessed Jesus was the Christ would be labeled heretical and cast out of the synagogue, John 9.22. Because Calvinist socialization processes include milieu control, there is an emphasis on group conformity and unanimity, such that anything which questions or threatens to cast dispersions on the doctrine is met with negative reinforcements, which may include public humiliation or punitive correction. The Calvinist who does not purport himself carefully can be cast out of the synagogue. Being labeled a Pelagian, for example, can represent rejection and demonizing of an individual within the group, since it is frequently used as an extreme pejorative with demonic connotations. A need for peer acceptance or a subconscious need for family cohesion may exist within each member as his individual identity is remapped into the group's identity. As a result of carrot-stick methodology, Calvinists become strongly compelled to honor the sacred object and to protect it from disparagement with a militant vigilance reminiscent of the brown shirts of 1940s Germany. These socialization processes help explain the behaviors people observe when Calvinists are faced with questions about the system's logical conclusions of glorified evil. In order to protect the sacred object from criticism, Calvinists exhibit a variety of avoidance strategies. 1. Using equivocal language to call evil good. 2. Casting ad hominems on the questioner, with accusations of maliciousness towards Calvinism or God. 3. Categorical denials and refusals to recognize rational conclusions. 4. Language designed to camouflage the specter of glorified evil. 5. Appeal to the you-don't-understand-us argument. 6. Appeal to the inscrutable argument. 7. Deviating from Calvin's strict why and how assertions, manufacturing a softer mask over the system and making it more palatable, i.e., mainstream, by obfuscating its glorified evil components. The most Christ-like way of interacting with Calvinists using these tactics is to understand the demands the system requires of them, as well as the psychological dependencies engendered in them, and treat them with respect and compassion. But it is also critical. One realizes the degree to which these influences result in their unflinching allegiance, stoicism, ethical compromises, and a language thoroughly permeated with subtleties. Calvinists are often driven by internally conflicting urgencies. 1. The urgency to retain strict allegiance for group peer acceptance or recognition. 2. The urgency for recruitment and the expansion of their population. 3. The urgency to advertise their system in the most grandiose terms. 4. The urgency to stave off or minimize the stigmas of glorified evil and godly evil. These then become the urgencies that drive Calvinists, and we should quite easily see how these urgencies drive them to deploy language techniques that are disingenuous. We, after all, are still members of a lost and fallen world. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Dishonest language techniques are, in fact, an integral part of what it means to be human. None of us are immune. Every time we step into a grocery store, we are surrounded by dishonest language. Every time we turn on a TV, we are exposed to dishonest language techniques. We are exposed to these techniques daily, on multiple levels, and in every aspect of our social interactions. And Calvinism's urgencies have simply driven them to assimilate doublethink and evolve and perfect their own unique doublespeak language. Part 11. Calvinism's Four Communication Modes Alternating Semantic Models There is a now godly good, now godly evil, alternating emphasis consistent within Calvinistic language, and a recognizable characteristic is the framing of concept pairs reflecting a dualistic cosmos. We can also observe linguistic processes which alternate between four different modes of communication. 1. Theological Boasting Mode 
Here he is eulogizing God's good pleasure and God's sovereignty, which entails both glorified good and glorified evil. Or he might be lauding the system's image or persons. 2. Theological Defense Mode Here he is defending the system's representations of glorified evil as necessary and right. Dualism and universal divine causal determinism are what make the system superior for him. What gives the system its distinctiveness and function as phylacteries for him? But the glorified evil component is morally problematic. To compensate its impact, the Calvinist will switch to 3. As if mode. This is his inventive mode, and his language is often cosmetic in nature. In this mode, he might create philosophical inventions, as if they were biblical, or represent his own unique understanding of Calvinism. As if it were core Calvinism. Or he might communicate as if the system's divine evil component doesn't exist. Or he might frame God's causal role in a given event as if it were active and then alternate to framing it as if it were passive. Or man's causal role in a given event as if libertarian free will doesn't exist and then alternate to framing it as if it does. Or he might frame dualistic sentences containing mutually exclusive presuppositions as if their contradiction doesn't exist. In ASF mode, assertions are made solely based on the expediency of the moment, and enunciated as if it, they are fully logically coherent. ASF mode is quite powerful because recipients may be ill-prepared to manage an inexhaustible volume of ad hoc inventions and semantic subtleties. 4. Pastoral mode. Here he utilizes soft-spoken, emotive, religious, or sophistic language to hide the system's glorified evil components while projecting benevolence. In pastoral mode, his language is often designed to mimic the language of mainstream Christianity, which, ironically, he sternly condemns as soon as he switches back into theological boasting mode. And this tactic of alternating between theological boasting mode and pastoral mode may be likened to a double agent operating within two countries in conflict with each other. Part 12. Sovereignty becomes God's identity marker. With causal determinism as the underlying structure of the theology, it's no wonder that Calvinists raise God's sovereignty as the supreme attribute, and Calvinists frequently enunciate sovereignty as the key identifier of God. All other attributes of God may then be implicitly seen as functionally subservient to sovereignty. For example, a popular Calvinist pastor, John Piper, asks the question, how does a sovereign God exercise his love? Here, the wording clearly infers a hierarchy concerning the attributes of God, where the exercise of God's love is enunciated as subservient to sovereignty. Calvinist Jonathan Edwards states it as, The sovereignty of God is his absolute, independent right of disposing of all creatures according to his own pleasure. Calvinist A.W. Pink states it as, Can we be too extreme in insisting upon the absoluteness and universality of the sovereignty of God? And again, Pink states, When we say that God is sovereign in the exercise of his love, we mean that he loves whom he chooses. God does not love everybody. Sovereignty has been described as the essence of God, the essence of the gospel, the essence of faith, the essence of holiness, the essence of love, the essence of wrath, and the essence of grace. It is not unrealistic to consider that sovereignty within Calvin's system expands to consume all else, and how easy it is to understand how that would be the case when one recognizes the underlying foundational construct and lens through which one looks at all of the data of life is universal divine causal determinism. Every Calvinist who would ever be lauded as a great Calvinist has been applauded within the society by his own way of eulogizing God's sovereignty. It is interesting to note statistically, however, the consistency with which all such enunciations fall short of lifting the curtain so that the foundation, universal divine causal determinism, 
can be recognized for the indispensable role it plays in producing the radical distinction that makes Calvinistic sovereignty superior to alternative conceptions for the Calvinist. It would not be uncommon to hear a Calvinist accuse alternative theologies as being based upon philosophy or worldliness, and Calvinism based 100% upon Scripture. Knowing what we know about the evolution of Christian theology and the role of syncretism within its evolution, what is the statistical probability that such an assertion can ever possibly be believed? The unfortunate byproduct of what appears to be pervasive system glorification is that the vast majority of Calvinists who trust their prospective author, scholar, pastor, or teacher when they are told the system consists of the 100% pure solid gold of Scripture, happily accept all such eulogistic boasting without the slightest twinge or question, and as naturally as a fish swallows a worm. The Calvinist is aware that sovereignty that is distinctively Calvinistic will be unpalatable to outsiders. As such, he will be careful to confine strict Calvinistic sovereignty to the fold, i.e., to insiders who honor them. Whereas in public forums and published books, his enunciations predominate definitions of sovereignty common to mainstream Christianity, enunciated in Calvinistic terminology, producing the appearance of being distinctives of Calvinism. But he cannot remain in that mode forever, because enunciating a mainstream definition of sovereignty doesn't support the assertion that Calvinism's distinctive sovereignty is superior. And to that end, straw man definitions of sovereignty can be crafted, easily viewed as aberrant, in order to assert a need for a superior Calvinistic perspective. David Bentley Hart, an Eastern Orthodox theologian and philosopher, writes, The curious absurdity of all such doctrines is that, out of a pious anxiety to defend God's transcendence against any scintilla of genuine creaturely freedom, they threaten effectively to collapse that transcendence into absolute identity with the world and the devil. For unless the world is truly set apart from God and possesses a dependent but real liberty of its own analogous to the freedom of God, everything is merely a fragment of divine volition, and God is simply the totality of all that is and all that happens. There is no creation, but only an oddly pantheistic expression of God's unadulterated power. Part 13 Viewing God's intentions through the lens of universal divine causal determinism. As has been originally stated, Calvin asserts that God's determinative causal will is effectual for all events universally, and that every event is determined in advance, at the foundation of the world, and prior to the time in which each event will obtain. This overarching view controls Calvin's perception of God's interactions with humanity described within Scripture. For example, Calvin writes concerning the Genesis narrative where God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat of the forbidden tree. Here, Calvin notes that Adam and Eve's obedience was not what obtained. Instead, their disobedience obtained. A posteriori knowledge. Calvin, following his line of reasoning, asserts that God must have actually willed Adam and Eve's disobedience, or else it would not have been possible to obtain. But this brings into question God's deliberate choice to communicate to Adam and Eve that which was contrary to his real will. Calvin asserts that God must withhold information from his people when he communicates. Here Calvin creates an ad hoc rescue, claiming that God spoke to Adam and Eve a revealed will and that God must have withheld from Adam and Eve his true will, which Calvin then construes as God's secret will. Unfortunately, Calvin doesn't address the critical difference between withholding information from someone and purposefully misleading someone. For Calvin, it logically follows that the only way man can know God's real or secret will is after a given event obtains. A posteriori knowledge. As a result, God may represent himself to his people in a way that is in total opposition to his real intentions. In short, God communicated to Adam and Eve in such a way 
as to deliberately mislead them about his true intentions for them, leading them to believe what he intended for them was their success in obedience while simultaneously applying an overwhelming supernatural causal force sufficient to ensure they would not. A Calvinist argument to support this reasoning could be, if God truly intended for Adam and Eve to obey, then they would obey. For it is not possible for an event to obtain that is in opposition to what God determines through His immutable decrees. Therefore it could not be not possible for Adam and Eve to obey, when God's secret will was that they disobey. And Calvin further reasons that the way we know what God's true will was, is, or will be, is by simply observing which events obtain, a posteriori knowledge. In this case, Adam and Eve disobeyed. So, Calvin reasons, God's true will was for them to disobey, even though what he communicated to them was the opposite. Part 14. He loves me, he loves me not, compartmentalized doublethink. Additional consequences of this line of reasoning become apparent. That God purposefully communicates to his people and does so strategically with the intent of misleading them about his true intentions. It then follows that within this view, God applies distinctions, which he does not reveal to his people when he speaks. And this, of course, raises further questions concerning Scripture as it relates to us today, as Scripture is held as God's foremost way of communicating to us. Since we hold that Scripture is the breathed Word of God, if we then hold, as Calvin does, that God purposefully misrepresents himself when he communicates to his people, how are we to know if what God has communicated within Scripture is his revealed will or his secret will as it concerns us? How do we know if what we read within Scripture is applicable to us or not? Historically, Calvinists have answered this question using words that enunciate distinctions such as God's prescribed will versus God's decreed will. In this case, God's prescribed will is what we read in Scripture. But again, God's prescribed will is to be distinguished from God's decreed, secret, real will. And in a dualistic cosmos, these two wills can be diametrically opposed, which Calvin additionally affirms by stating, Sometimes God causes those whom he illumines only for a time to partake of it, and then he justly forsakes them on account of their ungratefulness and strikes them with even greater blindness. The implications are all too clear that God firstly, determinatively, and meticulously leads a person to believe they are elected, saved, and bound for heaven. And then, at some later point in time, determinatively and meticulously renders certain they spend eternity in a lake of fire. Here we have a person, made a believer by God, resting upon pastoral assurances that he can trust what he reads in Scripture, with at least a subconscious awareness that God may actually be misleading him. It is no wonder that this would engender a form of doublethink, a cognitive condition in which the believer simultaneously embraces two mutually contradicting beliefs as both true, and the mind learns to compartmentalize these in such a way as to avoid cognitive dissonance. Father Wilbur Ellsworth, in Journey Out of Reformed Theology, states, There was a young man in the church who came to me, good, lovely guy, seriously involved with a young lady, to marry her. I just love that couple. He came to me one day and said, I am deeply depressed. My soul is dark. I said, why? He said, I don't love God the way I should. I said, tell me why. What's happening? He said, I don't love God as I should because I'm not sure he loves me as much as I need. I'm not sure I'm elect. Well, if I needed another stab in the heart, that did it. We sat there for three hours. Finally, I said to him, If you believe you can't be sure of God's love for you, then I will admit you can't love him as you need to. What does 1 John say? We love because he first loved us. I think this is the cruelest moment I've ever had in my entire ministry. I said to him, If that is your theology, I have nothing to offer you. He just stared at me. I said, 
I don't believe for a moment that that is the testimony of Scripture. That is not the testimony of the holy tradition, of the Church. But if you embrace that theology, I sorrowfully agree with you, you are stuck. We talked for about another ten minutes, and he left under that weight. To minimize the degree of consternation this doctrine has had on sincere Calvinists who seek to understand their relationship to God and to understand God's intentions for them as individuals, some Calvinist pastors have historically taught their congregations. They are to automatically assume God's intentions for them are honorable and retain that as their foremost consideration of God's will. But one can't help bear in mind that God's real intent for them may be a lake of fire, since that follows from the arguments of Calvin himself. But it is more critical to recognize that in the system, honorable, as it relates to God, has no I posteriori meaning, because it is not given to the creature to judge what honorable means in relation to God. The believer is to approach God as if his secret will is their eternal blessing without really knowing what the a posteriori meaning of eternal blessing will be. They will only know what God's secret will be for them at the moment they either arrive in heaven or the lake of torment and fire. At that time they will have a posterior knowledge of what type of eternal blessing, heaven or hell, God's good pleasure and immutable decree determined for them. Some Calvinist pastors have resolved that there is simply no sense in worrying about whether God's intentions for you are heaven or an eternal lake of fire. Calvinist pastor John Piper states this by asserting that you are to declare that whatever God does, he will always do right. But again, it logically follows that at this time, it is not given for you to have a posteriori knowledge of what right means. Right is whatever God's good pleasure is at any moment, and it is only given for the creature to know what God's good pleasure will be after it obtains. In this context, the meaning of right becomes arbitrary. In a good-evil dualistic cosmos, right could mean good, or it could just as easily mean evil. And this introduces ambiguity into the meanings of words such as right, honorable, righteous, etc., Mainstream Christians readily observe within the teachings of Jesus how he always maintains a sharp line of demarcation between the concepts of good and evil, and Jesus never introduces ambiguity to this line of demarcation when referencing the conduct of God. Jesus never depicts God as predisposed to conduct that could be misconstrued as evil in the ways that Calvin is forced to do. And so the system's consistent blurring of Jesus' line of demarcation between good and evil has quite naturally been a perennial concern for mainstream Christians. Calvinists often assert this element of the system makes it a superior understanding of God. James White, an apologist for Calvinism, affirms this sentiment by calling it a more fully orbed or more nuanced theology. While the mainstream Christian is concerned with its perception of God's relationship to evil as ambiguous, or worse, dishonoring Jesus for the sake of a superior theology. Additionally, Christians readily observe this blurring effect as ubiquitous within all pagan religions. In the occult, they see white and black witches, and Lucifer is both the angel of light and prince of darkness. In the system of yin-yang, Light and darkness are both fully justified, as they are both necessary components of the One. Harry Potter uses the same energy that the villain uses, except he uses it for good, while the villain uses it for evil. Does this make Harry Potter a reflection of God? Does Harry Potter's ability to use demonic energy for good provide a more fully orbed way of perceiving God and his cosmos? David Bentley Hart writes, for after all, if it is from Christ that we are to learn how God relates himself to sin, suffering, evil, and death, it would seem that he provides us little evidence of anything other than a regal, relentless, and miraculous enmity against sin and death. Sin Jesus forgives, suffering Jesus heals, evil Jesus casts out, and death 
Jesus conquers. And absolutely nowhere does Christ act as if any of these things are part of the eternal work or purposes of God. The Old Testament contains a narrative of King Solomon receiving Holy Spirit-inspired wisdom from God, and the narrative provides a description of what that wisdom looked like in the story of two women arguing over their right of ownership to a newborn child. Solomon tests the type of love each woman has for the child by commanding the child be chopped in half. A question might be asked, is Solomon using this strategy as a means of discerning which woman is the biological mother? Or is it possible Solomon is using it as a means of discerning which woman more reflects the nature and character of God and his intentions for the child? Since Solomon's wisdom is Holy Spirit inspired, the latter would seem plausible. Does God really care about which woman is the biological mother? Or is God's intention that the child would have a mother that loves the child in a way that more reflects his love for mankind? As the story unfolds, one woman agrees to have the child cut in half, while the other throws herself over the child in a self-sacrificial manner. The Calvinist might be asked, which woman more reflects the nature and character of God? The one who sacrifices her own right of sovereignty over the child so that the child may live, or the one who would cut the child in half for her good pleasure? If the Calvinist be consistent with Calvin himself, he could easily answer the later. But we can see how this would put the Calvinist in a difficult position, attempting to remain consistent with Calvin's concept of utilitarian sovereignty. Some would unabashedly say the woman who wanted the child cut in half more accurately reflects a sovereign, all-powerful God who rules the universe solely for his good pleasure. Others, not so intent on asserting sovereignty, would find a way to refute the question, perhaps by asserting they hold God's intentions as only benevolent. But that assertion contradicts Calvin's basic premise that God acts only according to his good pleasure and the secret counsel of his will, from which evil cannot be withheld and which man is not given to know. In any case, mainstream Christians quite naturally associate the blurring of Jesus' line of demarcation between good and evil, which they observe within Calvin's system, as perhaps a sign of, or indicative of, a pagan doctrine. And one, which dangerously distorts the creature's perception of a God of holiness and perfection, the same distorted perception of God that the serpent in the garden introduced to Adam and Eve. In mainstream Christianity, the words holiness, perfection, and love do not have ambiguous a posteriori meanings because they are aspects of God's character and His character is determinative of His conduct. Unlike the doctrine of the divine right of kings, the mainstream Christian holds that God does subject himself to his own declared standards of ethics. And Jesus' declarations, On earth as it is in heaven, and be ye holy as your heavenly Father is holy, do not have any additional exegetical distinctions imposed on them. Since the mainstream Christian views God's holiness expressed within his moral laws as determinative to his conduct as well as man's, this resolves to one golden standard of morality and ethics applicable on earth as it is in heaven. Additionally, the mainstream Christian interprets Jesus' statement, When you see me, you see the Father, as inferring man's knowledge of God and his conduct by virtue of a posteriori knowledge of Jesus. But for Calvin, God's standard of conduct remains shrouded behind a veil, which he calls the secret and inscrutable counsel of God. And since this is the case, it is not given for man to have a posteriori knowledge of what holiness or love means, as they pertain to God, which, for the mainstream Christian, resolves to a blurring of Jesus' line of demarcation between good and evil. The mainstream Christian looks aghast at how completely the Calvinist embraces a purely utilitarian God because it is not the God they see reflected in Jesus. And the Calvinist looks at the mainstream Christian who doesn't embrace his utilitarian God and sees a rebellious semi-heretic.
as to whether the Calvinist views Jesus as purely utilitarian is unknown, as they seem to be strangely quiet about their concepts of Jesus and his character. Because of the Calvinists' negligible emphasis on Jesus, mainstream Christians often comment that Calvinism appears non-Christ-centric. And that seems to make sense, since God and his sovereignty are the system's crown jewels. Part 15. Double standard leads to double think, leads to double speak. The Calvinistic system then resolves to two standards of ethics, one for God which is inscrutable, and one for man which is expressed by God's moral laws. When the Calvinist is communicating in as-if mode, he may appeal to a universal moral law as if it exists in his system. But this assertion is incoherent because it would logically entail that God adhered to a universal standard. We must remember that in the Calvinist system, only God's sovereignty is universal. All else is limited. For Calvin, God's morality lies hidden behind a veil. Calvin calls the secret counsel of his will. There is, however, an earthly morality based upon God's commandments. But that standard of morality is relative only to the creature, and God cannot be held accountable to it, for to do so would compromise his sovereignty. The Calvinist may try to talk his way around this point, but in such case, one would want to be on the lookout for ambiguous wordplay or self-contradictions. In response to the he loves me, he loves me not syndrome, Calvinist pastors may teach their congregations to simply refuse to believe the least desirable outcome. But it's easy to see how this becomes double-think, which eventually becomes double-speak. And outsiders express perennial frustration at trying to understand the doctrine as it is enunciated with double-speak as a natural part of the language. Outsiders in most cases simply don't know enough about the subtle nuances of the doctrine in order to realize the degree to which doublethink is required and has been successfully assimilated. Over numerous generations, Calvinists have developed their own lexicon of terms used to reinforce Calvinist distinctions. God's prescribed will is for your salvation, but God's decreed will may be for your eternal torment. And so, he loves me, he loves me not, quite naturally results in a form of doublethink, a doublethink version of the Good Shepherd. There once was a Good Shepherd who had 100 totally depraved sheep. For one of the totally depraved sheep, the Good Shepherd dedicated a room in his house, ensuring it all the lush comforts his good house could provide. The other 99 totally depraved sheep he sent to a torture chamber to be tortured to death. Once the shepherd's good pleasure was accomplished, he turned to the one totally depraved sheep he had saved and said, I have saved the one totally depraved sheep and passed over the 99 because the 99 were totally depraved. Part 16. Unfalsifiable beliefs, ingenious pied pipers, inscrutabilities and endorphins. Many beliefs are inherently unfalsifiable, not able to be proven false but not necessarily true. Such beliefs engender significant numbers of adherents when men of greatness and genius can make them appealing, and they have the added benefit of never being successfully refuted. Studies have been done within social psychology on the observable characteristics of unfalsifiable belief systems. One study was submitted by Justin Friesen, Troy Campbell, and Aaron Kay to the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology citing reasons unfalsifiable belief systems are so appealing. Certain personality types are drawn to an unfalsifiable belief system because the system requires a high degree of philosophical maintenance, which the psychologists described as both offensive and defensive. Obviously, people who have a bent towards intellectualism are part of the demographics. This demand for philosophical maintenance provides a rich environment for persons of intellectual genius or verbal eloquence to gain notoriety. Such persons can engineer and maintain highly sophisticated arguments in promotion or defense of the system, which appear wonderfully compelling and completely rational, but when examined under expert scrutiny, 
surface logical puzzlements, and are inherently reliant upon sophisticated linguistic maneuvers. Defending the system can be likened to a chess game or sword fighting with maneuvers which include attacks, counterattacks, lunges, thrusts, and going for the jugular. Within linguistic disputations, all of which can be highly endorphin producing for the right kind of persona. Another aspect of an unfalsifiable belief system is how readily it can function as a cosmetic mask, which enriches the persona of its adherent. Gnosticism has been consistently noted as having this quality. Writer Philip J. Lee, in his book Against the Protestant Gnostics, has a chapter devoted to the phenomena of Gnostic elitism, where he observes how Gnosticism appeared as a private form of Christianity, which he writes, of necessity, correlates to religious elitism. When the self effectively becomes a member of the elect or select group, set apart from those who are common or somehow unworthy, it quite naturally evolves a persona that subconsciously distinguishes itself and its adherents as superior in some way. Philip writes, There is little doubt that Calvin, among other reformers, was strongly inclined towards Augustinian elitism in his suspicion that the great majority of humanity would suffer damnation. Calvin did warn against spiritual pride, Philip relates. However, such warnings against and denials of elitism may only prove to serve as ingenious cosmetics crafted upon a religious mask behind which the elitist persona can hide itself from the stigma of spiritual pride. Philip writes, With such a determined view of the fate of the damned, it is difficult to see how followers of Calvin could be other than elitist. New England Calvinists, almost from the beginning, saw themselves a spiritual aristocracy. Cotton Mather, a member of the New England Calvinists, for example, insisted that Jesus' intercession only reaches the elect of God. Philip writes, The glimpse of the pleroma, divine dualistic powers, so important to the ancient Gnostics, was also the decisive factor in New England Calvinism. Alvin Plantinga, American analytic philosopher, refers to the appeal of unfalsifiable beliefs when he relates how intellectuals are drawn towards solipsism. A solipsist believes that he is the only real person alive on earth, and all other persons are figments of his imagination. Plantinga muses on the genius of the human mind, which is so capable at compartmentalizing data, relegating data which can be used to affirm the belief as wonderful and legitimate, while scorning data which contradicts the belief as disdainful and illegitimate. Imagine you are a solipsist riding in a taxi at high speed down a highway. You believe the cars are real, you are real, and the speed you are traveling is real, but the person driving the car in the front seat is a figment of your imagination. Imagine all of the highly complex and fascinating neurological processes your brain has to accomplish in order to survive and thrive while tenaciously holding the belief. Thus we see man's fascination with the unfalsifiable. It's interesting to note that a deterministic worldview manifests these characteristics. Researchers in behavioral science performed experiments to determine whether a determinist worldview or a libertarian worldview came naturally to people, or whether either might be influenced by one's culture. The experiment was done to kindergarten children from diverse cultural backgrounds. The scientist placed a folded cardboard box in front of a child, opened the box, reached her hand into the box, and then touched the bottom of the box with the child watching. The child was then asked if the scientist's hand could have touched any other part of the box. The experiment was designed to evidence whether the child's natural worldview was deterministic or indeterministic. The child answering that the scientist could only touch the part of the box which she did would evidence a deterministic worldview. The child answering that the scientist could touch any part of the box she desired would evidence a libertarian worldview. In 100% of the cases, children from all cultures indicated the scientist could touch any part of the box she chose to. 
It was also suspected that the preponderance of people who assert a belief in a deterministic worldview derive their belief from others who successfully persuade them into the belief, and in the vast majority of cases, the process is facilitated by some form of honored intellectualism, such as an ardently admired college professor persuading a student. As children grow up, the concepts of one's consequences of choice, in obedience or disobedience, constantly reinforce a predilection towards libertarian free will. Libertarian free will is the de facto presupposition all persons assume in daily social interactions. This then forces the one who tenaciously holds to a deterministic worldview to exercise the same neurological processes found within the unfalsifiable belief system and enjoy the same air of superiority, intellectual prowess, and philosophical efficacies with the accompanying endorphinal stimulations. Non-Calvinists occasionally remark about how Calvinists exhibit compartmentalized thinking. On the one hand, a deterministic worldview is explicitly and forcibly defended as the only legitimate view. And then curiously, totally abandoned within normal daily social interactions, where libertarian free will forms the de facto basis for judgment in all matters concerning right and wrong. One Arminian remarked, The Calvinist is a curious creature. He is 100% Arminian in all matters of daily intercourse and justice, and 100% anti-Arminian in all matters of theology. His belief system forces him to halt between two opinions. There will always be people who embrace a certain position so radically that no amount of evidence can ever change the mind. It is not uncommon for people to become so psychologically invested that anything that doesn't affirm the belief is rejected, discounted, and rationalized away. This, more than not, reflects recognized idiosyncrasies of human cognition and our inability to consider any observation or argument which casts aspersions on the sacred object. This has often been observed while presenting evidence to people tricked by paranormal con artists and mystic gurus. People often respond with anger and resentment, as if the truth were robbing them of the cherished belief. The ability for the human mind to look at a large body of evidence and focus on the 10%, which can be interpreted so as to affirm the belief, while rationalizing away the 90%, which contradicts it, is a tribute to the way man is fearfully and wonderfully made. And it can also be noted as evidence that love is indeed blind. It is illuminating to observe here another indicator of an unfalsifiable belief system. Successful offensive and defensive enunciations on its behalf require a perpetual evolution of ad hoc complexity by the addition of new, subtle, and increasingly sophisticated distinctions in order to make the system retain coherency and believability over time. As such, Calvinist enunciations become increasingly sophisticated and conceptually complex. Since that is the case, that Calvinists lament being misunderstood and misrepresented fits the pattern well, and keeping up with its ever-growing library of subtle nuances has been likened to chasing a greased pig. Part 17, Partisanship Identity, Vicarious Boastings, and the Seductiveness of Hero Worship. Kenneth Burke, 1897 an American literary theorist in Attitudes Toward History, writes, In America, it is natural for a man to identify himself with the business corporation he serves. This is his birthright, and insofar as he is denied it, he is impoverished and alienated. But insofar as business becomes a corrupt sovereign, his only salvation is to make himself an identity in an alternative corporation. The struggle to establish this alternative corporation is called the struggle for the one big union. Hence, the drive for industrial unionism for parties, farmers and workers, etc. Burke is describing the sociological phenomenon of an individual's remapping of personal identity. From an insignificant persona to an identity of preeminence by association with a group. Burke clues us that vicarious boasting is one of the outward manifestations to look for. One may note, however, the subtle ways in which identification serves as braggadocio. By it, 
the modest man can indulge in the most outrageous corporate boasting. He identifies himself with some corporate unit, church, guild, company, lodge, party, team, college, city, nation, etc. And by profuse praise of this unit, he praises himself, for he owns shares in the corporate unit. And by rigging the market, the value of the stock as a whole, he runs up the value of his personal holdings. We see the process in its simplest form when the music lover clamorously admires a particular composer and so shares vicariously in the composer's attainments. Such identification will be observable even among mistreated clerks of rival business concerns, as the sales girls of one department are somewhat contemptuous of the goods of the department store across the street, an attitude that the heads of the business are prompt to cash in on by putting company loyalty against interference from outside agitators and union organizers. The function of vicarious boasting leads into the matter of epic heroism and euphemistic vocabularies of motives. When heroes have been shaped by legend, with the irrelevant or incongruous details of their lives obliterated and only the most divine attributes expressed, the individual's covert boasting by identification with the hero need not lead to megalomania, extreme delusion of grandeur. The legendary hero is by definition a superman. He is the founder of a line. Not long ago, I watched a program on a Christian television channel noted for promoting Calvinism. The program contained a panel of Christians representing various segments of evangelical Christianity in response to increasing concerns over anti-Christian government policies. There were no indicators of sectarianism at the outset, so I became interested in the discussion. The host, calmly and impartially, asked a single question of each member of the panel, eventually coming to the last member at which point the host's demeanor suddenly changed and his language approached effusive doting. I said aloud, Watch this. I'll bet this is Calvinist propaganda at work. Sure enough, the host set up the last panel member, allowing him to launch into an embarrassingly prolonged idolization of Augustine, whom he called his homeboy. Inferring the answer to all of life's problems can be found in embracing Augustine and an allegiance to church. Of course, I understood his cloaked language for church meant Calvinism. The host went on, surreptitiously praising this one panel member, excitedly asking him to recommend book authors for the audience. Now I know I'm witnessing classic Calvinism at work, and I scrambled to obtain a notepad and scribble the names of the suggested authors to confirm my suspicions. Sure enough, each one was a staunch Calvinist. I watched for signs of agitation or insult on the faces of the other panel members during the embellished display and didn't detect any, but the event fits the model of Calvinistic vicarious boasting perfectly. And I applaud Kenneth Burke for describing this behavior for us so wonderfully. Calvinists play this game continuously on public forums, being extremely careful not to let people know they are promoting Calvinism and this is what clues us in that they are operating surreptitiously. The Calvinist owns shares in the corporate unit, and by rigging the market, assuming the role of an investment expert, he covertly sells dividends, seeking to induce buy-in on the stock, and by this process, runs up the value of his personal holdings while secretly longing for a little vicarious hero worship himself. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another, Galatians 5.25. For brethren, you've been called into liberty. Only don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by a gape. Serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, you shall agape your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed by one another. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3, 2 and 3. 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have lost your first love. Revelations 2.4 Every Christian group has its unique hierarchy of sins. Certain select sins are represented as grave and deadly, while others are systemically winked at, and some sins are actually lauded. Within the society of Calvinism, hero worship is never categorized as carnality or sin. On a systemic basis, respecting of persons is used as a carrot on a string technique, and Christian youth are particularly vulnerable to its seductions. The Calvinist cannot praise himself and be perceived as spiritually minded, but he can get around this obstacle by the strategy, which Kenneth Burke in his insightful and apt descriptions reveals as vicarious boastings. And unwitting Christians are totally void of any ability to recognize how they are ensnared by the lure of hero worship. Part 18. Don Quixote's Two-Headed Windmill, Calvin's Gnostic Dragon. The story of Don Quixote follows the adventures of Mr. Alonzo Quijano, who, having lost sanity and outfitted with a horse, knight's armor and lance, sets out to slay evil dragons, which ironically turn out to be windmills. Using highly rhetorical orations, the gallant one boldly boasts he will bring true divine justice to the world of chivalry and knighthood. Ever since Calvin's writings became circulated and examined, antagonists have perennially pointed to a two-headed Gnostic dragon lurking deep within the system's dark underworld. One head of the fierce beast breaths out ethical dilemmas from its inner belly, while the other billows out rational conundrums. Therefore, it is not uncommon for us to observe, within any given generation, a Don Quixote or two charging off, outfitted with shining philosophical armor, trying his gallant hand at slaying the formidable beast. We also note with Don Quixote's inflated knighthood, he carries the polished lance of inflated language. Dr. William Lutz, in Doublespeak, writes, Inflated language is a type of doublespeak designed to make the ordinary seem extraordinary, to make everyday things seem impressive, to give an air of importance to people, situations, or things that would not normally be considered important, to make the simple seem complex. Calvinist Dr. James N. Anderson understands Calvin's two-headed problem and gallantly sets out to try his hand at slaying the beast with a theory he calls the authorial model of providence. Unfortunately, what starts out as a theory ends up looking more like fanciful imaginations, but the details of the theory are illuminating for us as they affirm the existence of the system's ethical dilemmas and rational conundrums, i.e., its two-headed dragon. The idea seeks to assert a mystical and unknown divine causation, which is not subject to scientific rational laws of logic, and is to be distinguished from what is called intermundane, relating to, or residing in the heavenly realm, causation. Before we look at this, let's first recognize that secret knowledge is a consistent element within unfalsifiable belief systems. If something is mystical, secret, and inscrutable, how is it the believer happens to know just enough about it to build an exegetical labyrinth around it? How is it that he conveniently knows just enough facts about the secret gnosis to urge us to believe what he asserts is the gospel, and then righteously scold inquiring minds who dare ask logical questions? The story of Joseph Smith follows the same model, where it is asserted that he was shown the whereabouts of golden plates by a heavenly messenger named Moroni and learned the secret gnosis by being enabled to read hieroglyphic, reformed Egyptian text. Likewise, the Da Vinci Code asserts a secret gnosis, which, if revealed, could devastate the very foundation of Christianity. Here, alpha causation is construed as a mystical, unknown form of causation, which doesn't conform to the universal laws of rational logic. Unknown to us before now, divine causation operates at a fundamentally different level than intermundane causation. Here, divine causation is also called alpha causation and intermundane causation, beta causation. And further, alpha causation is likened to a human authoring a novel. 
The author can have characters in the novel doing hideous things, but since the author is not actually doing the hideous things himself, he is therefore not culpable. It turns out this idea is quite dated and collapses quickly with the understanding that characters in a novel are not real but imagined, while Adam and Eve were not imagined characters in a novel, but were real. Dr. Anderson does acknowledge this fact. So then, are alpha and beta causation real, or are they imagined within a novel idea? Early in the paper, Dr. Anderson writes, At some point in time, for reasons we may never understand, Adam chose evil over good. He rebelled against his creator, and in so doing he corrupted human nature and his progeny. But later in the paper he writes, Calvinists can affirm that there is a sufficient ultimate explanation for Adam's sin. God decreed it. Indeed, there is a sufficient causal explanation. God, Alpha, caused Adam's sinning. But he didn't Beta cause it. From there, he moves to the argumentum ad ignorantium argument, asserting, we cannot simply assume that our natural intuitions about beta causation can be transferred without qualification to alpha causation. But it hasn't yet been established whether alpha or beta causation are real or imagined. As was observed initially, the reason a human author would not be culpable for his character's actions is because the character doesn't exist. And since the character doesn't exist, culpability doesn't exist either. Additionally, if Adam is a character in God's novel, then Adam's sin is not logically necessary for the sake of the storyline of the novel, unless it is a requirement based on a limitation of God's abilities. Sin as a means to God's ends is only logically necessary if God's abilities for achieving his ends are somehow limited. But mainstream Christianity holds that God is omnipotent and therefore has no such limitations. And Calvinists agree that God can create a world in which he causally determines all creatures to love and serve him without the need for sin. So this line of reasoning, so far, appears somewhat contrived and its rational coherence questionable. If God is the ultimate sufficient cause of every event, then the appeal to an intermundane causation is a puzzlement, as the understood laws of physical causation are effectively rendered unnecessary, and the concept of primary and secondary causes are swallowed up by one single divine causal law, where all chains of events occur solely due to God's divine meticulous control over all events, no matter where each event occurs within a sequential chain. It appears what we have then is a form of mono-agency, where all entities, whether sentient or not, operate solely as instruments where all creaturely movements are caused by supernatural energies of divine decrees. So then, on this view, since God is the sole cause and movement of Adam's, every faculty, any causation on Adam's part, is either non-existent, or is at least so impotent that it is causally irrelevant. How can Adam be held accountable when supernatural forces, which he has no ability to resist or alter, bring about his every neurological and physical movement. Lastly, Dr. Anderson rules out beta causation on Adam's part, because Adam's internal state was wholly good when he sinned. This leaves alpha causation as the only possible causal force at work at the time. But if we follow Dr. Anderson's two assertions, A. Adam is culpable for sin, and B. Beta causation is ruled out, then we are left with the question of how Adam could have alpha-caused his own sin. Additionally, since it is asserted the God alpha-caused Adam's sinning, then how can we rationally say that Adam is solely culpable? If, however, the Calvinist can invent or discover a form of causation that defies all universal laws of logic, then that would be a different story. Perhaps in the future, such a causation will be discovered and then persons can be successfully convicted for crimes they don't have the ability to stop themselves from committing. Here we see the two urgencies classically at work in the Calvinist. Firstly, he wants to assert God's absolute monarchical control of all things, 
totally extracting all possible causal ability from the creature, attributing absolute universal causal determinism solely to God alone. But he is then left with a two-headed, unethical, and irrational dragon, and the concern for the negative impact it will have on Calvinism's reputation and possible recruitment potential. We observe that the labels Dr. Anderson uses are more inventive than the more commonly used terms, monergism versus synergism, where it is often asserted that good events occur from God's causal activity as monergistic events, and evil events occur from the combination of God's causal ability and man's causal ability as synergistic events. But even in the synergistic model, the Calvinist struggles providing any successful ethical or rational explanations for how God's causal role, asserted as unlimited in scope, is absolved, while man's role, forced upon him by necessitating supernatural decrees, is solely culpable. Dr. Anderson concludes by stating, At this point, I must confess that further answers escape me and I find myself concurring with Reformed theologians who concede that sin is intrinsically irrational, and the entrance of human sin into the world is in many respects shrouded in mystery. At this point, the two-headed dragon is certainly smiling, happily lurking within the dark caves of the doctrine. But who knows if some new Don Quixote in the far distant future will come forth and actually slay the ancient beast. In the meantime, what this provides for us is an affirmation of the system's two-headed issues, ethical dilemmas and rational conundrums. It also fits the model of irresolvable questions inherent within unfalsifiable beliefs, and we can also see how language facilitating plausible deniability becomes the last reliable defense. Part 19. Sovereignty Outweighs Ethics so then, this view allows that distinctions be made on attributes of God, such as His ethics, His morality, His benevolence, His love, His wrath, etc. All attributes except sovereignty have distinctions applied to them, which radically alter the scope of their application. But it cannot be allowed there be any distinctions applied to God's sovereignty, for sovereignty must never be compromised by any other attribute of God. For Calvin, God's world is one of monarchical absolutism. David Bentley Hart writes, Frankly, any understanding of divine sovereignty so unsubtle that it requires the theologian to assert, as Calvin did, that God foreordained the fall of humanity so that his glory might be revealed in the predestined damnation of the derelict, is obviously problematic and probably far more blasphemous than anything represented by the heresies that the ancient ecumenical councils confronted. Part 20. Calvinism's Exegetical Rules for the Interpretation of Scripture The Scripture indicates that God desires that all men be saved. Calvinists, historically, following Calvin's line of reasoning, assume that Scripture must contain non-explicit distinctions in this regard. Those distinctions must control the way one interprets the text of Scripture. Accordingly, distinctions based on philosophical rational are assumed unquestioningly, and especially upon Scriptures which represent God's will concerning persons. Calvinists realize that such distinctions are not explicit in the text. They therefore must assert those distinctions using exegetical rules, which control the interpretation of the text without physically altering it. All correct interpretation of Scripture must affirm the doctrine of universal divine causal determinism. Any interpretation that does not is heretical. So we observe that Calvinists have historically applied added distinctions to verses in Scripture, which are applied as implicit distinctions, because in most cases, those distinctions cannot be explicitly observed within the text. Although Calvinists have been noted as altering definitions for Greek words to make their meanings affirm universal divine causal determinism, they don't appear to be willing to physically alter the text of Scripture. And so, Calvinists have historically applied Calvinistic distinctions 
in an automatic fashion while reading the text. In other words, the added distinctions are automatically inserted into the text within the mind of the reader at the time the text is read. Calvinist Bible studies are ways of reinforcing this mental conditioning. One can argue that the practice is simply good exegesis, but it should be evident how easy it is to recognize a socialization process in which readers are conditioned to read the text through the lens of distinctions they are taught to assume as true. It eventually becomes automatic, and the reader is then completely convinced the way he is taught to read the text is, in fact, the plain reading of the text. Additionally, Calvinist study Bibles and books proliferate the Christian market, but are hardly ever labeled or advertised as Calvinist materials in order to proliferate their unique distinctions. With the understanding that Calvinist exegesis is driven by a rule that stipulates all Scripture must be interpreted so as to affirm universal divine causal determinism, and this rule requires adding distinctions into texts, some examples of the Calvinistic reading of 1 Timothy 2, 4 follow. God, particularly, desires all men be saved, but not in such a way that God, universally, desires all men be saved. This distinction is commonly called particular salvation. God, unsalvifically, desires all men be saved, but not in such a way that God, salvifically, desires all men be saved. God, uneffectually, desires all men be saved, but not in such a way that God, effectually, desires all men be saved. God desires all men saved, but not in such a way that God wills all men saved. All scholars note the Greek word thele in this verse is used over 200 times in the New Testament and typically denotes desire. Since this is the case, the Calvinist may make a distinction between God's desire and God's will, asserting that God desires all men to be saved, but does not will all men to be saved. But this argument flies in the face of his assertions that God conceives, determinatively causes, and meticulously renders certain all events which come to pass. This argument is an excellent example where, in his attempt to establish God's unlimited sovereignty, he shifts to the extreme position of explicitly and forcibly asserting God's absolute, universal, meticulous control over every event, including every human impulse. But when faced with the logical consequences of that assertion, retreats to the opposite extreme, with arguments that work to obfuscate the very meticulous control he just previously asserted. When doublethink is fully assimilated in the mind, it occurs spontaneously and automatically without thinking. On the one hand, Calvin asserts that whatever obtains is caused by God's good pleasure. So now we must consider God's good pleasure that person P is not saved, simultaneous with God's desire that person P is saved. And the Calvinist is forced to embrace yet another distinction between God's desire and God's good pleasure, as if God's good pleasure is out of sync with his desire. To paint a picture of a being who meticulously controls every atomic movement of every molecule in the universe, but then has desires that are out of sync with his pleasure, which are out of sync with his will, raises the specter of incoherency and grasping at straws. William Lane Craig, in Four Views on Divine Providence, notes the regrettable position he sees the Calvinist consistently puts himself in. Highfield, the Calvinist, thinks that God's will is invariably done and nothing escapes his will. It follows that God wills moral evil and even causes it to occur. Given that that is impossible, there must be no moral evil. Incredibly, but consistently, Highfield says, on page 67, If evil is that which God does not will, and God's will is always effective, then evil can have no genuine and lasting being. Highfield has to deny that people act sinfully. Highfield seems to appreciate the difficulty in which this puts him, where he says, If evil is nothing in itself, 
How can there really be evil acts, events, or states of affairs? Does my position not imply that they cannot exist? To most people this seems manifestly absurd. But if I admit that such things really exist and God's will is invariably done in and through them, how can I escape the charge that I am making God the doer of evil? How, indeed? Highfield tries to break down a sinful action into various aspects, such as intention, deliberation, decision, exertion, and results. But Highfield recognizes that evil intentions do occur. He says, The doctrine of providence locates the evil aspect of human action, not in the created being of humanity and not in its final results, but rather in the sinfulness of a heart that is bereft of the knowledge of God and the love of God and a neighbor. Sin is not God's creature. It has no positive existence, and the false images it projects can never be real. Clearly this answer will not suffice. For in universal divine causal determinism, the intention, the deliberation, the decision, and the exertion are all caused by God to occur. God is therefore the source of evil. Highfield tries to escape this result by saying, in evil acts, God's concurrence overcomes the evil in the act, not allowing it to be truly and lastingly realized, but instead bringing good out of evil. Alas, this is all to no avail. Of course, God can bring a good result out of evil, but the evil intent and decision are not therefore somehow rendered morally neutral, so that sin becomes an illusion. What we see repeatedly is simply a two-phased approach of asserting universal divine causal determinism on the one hand, but then being forced into the unfortunate position of having to equivocate and obfuscate aspects of that assertion in order to camouflage its objectionable consequences. In this instance, by asserting that evil is a projection of false images which can never be real. Removing the flowery language, evil is an illusion. Gordon D. Fee, Professor Emeritus in New Testament Studies, is considered one of the world's leading experts in pneumatology and textual criticism of the New Testament. Dr. Fee's commentary on 1 Timothy 2, 4 contains the following notes. The one clear concern that runs through the whole paragraph has to do with the gospel, as for everyone, all people. Verses 1, 4 through 6 and 7. In this view, the phrase, this is good, in verse 3 refers to prayer for everyone in verse 1, thus seeing verse 2 as something of a digression, albeit as before, 1, 12 through 17, a meaningful one. The best explanation for this emphasis lies with the false teachers, who either through the esoteric, highly speculative nature of their teaching, 1, 4 through 6, or through its Jewishness, 1, 7, or ascetic character, 4, 3, are promoting an elitist or exclusivist mentality among their followers. The whole paragraph attacks that narrowness. Paul now returns to his main concern, prayers for all kinds, for all people. The reason? Because God wants all people to be saved. That is good and pleases God might, of course, refer to the content of verse 2. But the relative clause in verse 4 indicates otherwise. This is good, Paul says, that is, prayers for everyone is good, and pleases God our Savior, precisely because the God who has saved us, our Savior, wants His salvation to reach all people. End of part one of audiobook.